So Kieran McGuire, we are Boxer Bants, and I'm very happy to be joined by former two-time world champion, former IFBA Super Bantamweight world champion, NABA featherweight champion, and WBC interim uh, champion, Maureen Shea. Um, Maureen, uh, thanks for uh, joining me tonight. Thank you so much. It's such a, it's an, it's a pleasure and honor. Mm. Uh, so the the, re, the, the, the the reason how I got in contact with you, it's, it's, it's a story for later on in this, but uh, I was going to, first of all, for people that don't know you, you're someone who is almost like part of the generation. You turned over in 2005 in boxing and you're kind of someone who, it, when you turn over the women's boxing was coming to the end of that generation of um like Leila Ali and uh, Christy Martin and whatnot so you're kind of one of the last members of kind of the, the the OGE kind of era you kind of saw the whole transition from then to now with your Katie Taylors your Carissa Shields and whatnot um yes what was it what's it like for you growing up in the Bronx um and how did that journey take you from there to boxing? Well, it was it was interesting for me. I was um I actually I always say you know um, God is my higher power and and you know I'm a Christian and I would always say you know boxing was a gift from God and and what I do with it is my gift back to Him and that goes back to the story of how I found boxing. Um, I actually found myself at 17 years old in an abusive relationship. And if you want to go back a little bit, just to give you a background about who I am and mm. and how I grew up. I was always that kid. I mean, every family's got the kid that's the rebel. I was definitely the black sheep. Um, I have a brother who's 10 years older than me. Um, I was born to Irish Irish and Mexican parents. My mother is Mexican. My father's Irish. And um, I was very much my father's. I am very much my father's daughter. And a very stubborn, very, you know, you march to the beat of your own drum. I had a shirt that said, here comes trouble. Um, I always did what I wanted. And I always had to learn the hard way. And that was a, a running joke in my family. Like Maureen does things Maureen's way. Uh, I didn't do well with authority. So it led me to find some some issues growing up, some uh, battles within my family, especially with my father being, he was a, a Marine. Um, he was in the, he was the military and he was also a, a NYPD detective. And so he was definitely the disciplinarian and definitely the one that enforced the rules. And another thing about how I was raised was my my father never treated me really like a girl boy. Like my, my brother's 10 years older than me, but there was never like a gender in how he treated us. It was always okay. If you make a mistake, you're going to pay the consequences. So regardless of what your gender was, he wasn't any easier on my brother or, or harder on me. So he was very much like that. So for example, I mean, he was a little tough. If I didn't come home on curfew, he would lock the door and say, okay, well, then sleep outside. You know, like you're going to do what I say, you're going to learn. And, you know, obviously I was safe. I slept in the backyard. I wasn't, you know, I mean, that's people would say, oh, that's child abuse today. I'm like, you know, that taught me a lot about responsibility and actually, you know, every action has a reaction and there's consequences to your choices. So I thank him for that, but it did cause a lot of this growing up. We weren't allowed to have cable, Nintendo. He said, go out and play in the dirt. And, and that was tough uh, being, and my father was, you know, he was 41 when she when he had me and my mother was 38. So my brother being 10 years older, I was kind of in this weird generation. Um, going forward, I was in high school. And again, I never really, I was friends with everybody. I never really followed a crowd. And I ended up actually getting kicked out of high school. Uh, I went to Preston High School and uh, I was in an all-girl Catholic school and I just didn't follow the rules. And they said, okay, we, you know, you're, you're getting kicked out. So I got kicked out of there. I ended up in Lehman High School. So that just led me to this place where I was trying to find my identity and trying to find really who I was in this rebellious world uh, that I created for myself. So when I went to, um, when I was, was in Lehman High School, I met, I met um, a guy and uh, we became, you know, we were, we were dating. And uh, he was my best friend. And it's unfortunate because as that relationship went on, I found out later on that he was doing drugs and doing steroids that was altering his, his state of being. And he became abusive, uh, physically abusive, verbally abusive, then physically abusive. And I ended up going to the gym to better myself for him. Now, going back, I always played sports. I played softball. My parents had me in everything because I was always a very high energy person. And my mom's like, well, put her in something, you know, let her burn off that energy. I never did well in team sports. I was a little too aggressive and I led with emotion a lot of the time and passion. And, uh, you know, that's okay, but mine just wasn't controlled. It wasn't a controlled rage, which is what boxing kind of taught me I had to be. Boxing's a little bit, obvious, well, a lot less forgiving than 
softball and basketball, you get fouled out of a game. That's it. Boxing, you get emotional, you get hit in the face. You know, it, it kind of, it kind of snaps you out of it. So going into this gym, I actually walked into the back and there was a boxing ring. And I was like, wow, how can I connect? And there was a lot of uh, mostly um, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Latin American uh, men back there. And I, I, there was a Russian guy back there, um, not too many Irish. But when I got back there, I said, how am I going to connect with these men? And I speak fluent Spanish, thanks to my mom. And I, I connected with the trainer, Willie Soto, who I still speak to today. And he said, do you want to try? And I said, yeah. And from the minute that I put on those gloves and I hit that bag, I found an empowerment. And I found it was almost like I found a strength within myself. And I found also a way to take this negative you know, this, this um, chaotic rage that I had and control it and get it out into something. And it was the heavy bag. And after that, I, I, I fell in love with the sport. And, um, you know, I, I always said, okay, what's next? I never was dreamt of being a world champion. I didn't, you know, I, I struggled with low self-esteem during this time in this relationship. I had an eating disorder. I, I went through a lot. And, um, you know, I was really like a shell of, of a woman going into the gym and, and, and very scared, but also, very attracted to this, this energy and this fight that I had inside of me that I could get out on the bag. And um, with doing that, I guess I found out, I never realized I was a true athlete until I started boxing because I never really stuck to one thing. I played an instrument, I was in, I played sport, but I never really found something that really understood, that I felt boxing understood me. And I understood boxing. And, uh, you know, from then on, you know, I, I began training. Mm. So uh, come from my standpoint, looking at this, um, you you had a Catholic Irish father, um, yep. which obviously a I Catholic I, Mexican mother. Yeah, <clears throat> a Catholic Irish. Father, yeah, so obviously for me, I've seen it from every angle in this country. The the change because I was in ninety, so I kind of saw the the change in culture, especially with the church and things like that. Um, whereas your dad was from that other generation, so okay, I. I, I yeah. I've, I've met many that, that would have been the same as your, your dad. Like, um, and on top of that, women's boxing on top of that, uh, so unaccepted at that time, like our first female Irish boxer, uh, Deirdre Gogarty for Christina Martin, like she couldn't get a license here. She had to go yeah. abroad. And, um, I and, mm -hmm. and, yeah. And Katie as well, like, you know, had to fight boys for most of her life. So what was that like? <clears throat> How did your dad, and that abusive boyfriend reacted to him when you said you were boxing? Well, the abusive boyfriend, I was trying to get away from him. So I kind of hid it from him. I really hid it from him. Um, but but to my father, uh, you know, my father didn't know I was in the abusive relationship because I hid a lot. And I and I and and that's what happens a lot with abused women. You know, there's signs and things like that. But I was the rebel. So I wasn't really home. I just, you know, I just would go to the gym. And during that time, my father found out that I was boxing and he said, in this house, you have to work and go to school. You can't do all three. And I said, watch me. Because the worst thing you could tell me is not to do something, especially my dad. When he told me, don't do it, I was going to prove him that I could do it. And I did. And I worked. I went to school and I boxed. So I'd get up in the morning. Um, I would, you know, I had actually, I was in college. So I would go to school. I would do my classes. I was working at um, Hitachi, a Japanese company, their East Coast headquarters. I would go to, to there. I would work. It was not far from my college. And then on the way home, I would pass the boxing gym and I'd go in there and I'd train for several hours. Um, I'd stay there until sometimes 10 o'clock at night because the men had the right to go into the ring before me. So my coach was busy with the guys and I would just jump rope. I would hit the speed bag. I'd hit the heavy bag and I just wait, wait till I got my time on the mitt work or I'd spar with the guys. You know, the guys would play around with me. I was like, oh, they were very kind, you know, um, but they, I think they, saw, they, I don't know if they saw me as like, a real fighter, but they, they saw my dedication and they knew that I was committed because I showed up every day and I never complained and I just waited my turn. So I think they respected that and they would get in the ring and play around with me. I have video or pictures of myself with um, a Mexican fighter. He was a professional, Antonio Oliveros, um, uh, you know, another fighter, um, you know, that, that, uh, that Elvir, he, he was another uh, Albanian fighter. He got in the ring with me and I, I still actually speak to them today. I still know who they, they know me you know, from then, from seven, when I was 17. So I think that was the respect. My dad definitely didn't support it, but I had to prove to him. My grades were good. I was working and I was able to still go to the gym. But I don't think my parents ever thought that I would take this as far as I have. Was he ever worried as well, or even just the, the stigma behind it? Like, oh, my daughter's 
like fighting and getting punched in the face when it's multi met like w- was there you know it's interesting my dad knew i was a fighter because i was there and i he knew that i had this violent streak in me because i got into fights in the street and my dad always told me to defend myself so i don't know if it was so much that i was getting punched in the face i think it was more so the security of a job and being like if she thinks she's going to do this and work i'm sure he was concerned with my health and concerned about getting hit but I think he's like, you don't need to do this. Like, why are you doing this? There's no money in this. Like, he wanted me to be a cop and then be a lawyer. So I went to college and I got my degree in English. But he's like, okay, with that, go, go, go in the DEA. Go, they're looking for women who speak fluent Spanish. Should be perfect. And I took the NYPD test, and I just didn't want to be a cop. You know, it just I took several different police tests in New York and in California, and I just it wasn't where I wanted to be. You know, so it was hard for me because. You know, the, the boxing team, the NYPD boxing team wanted to recruit me as an amateur and they would have taken care of me as far as letting me, you know, fight for them. So I could have had boxing, a pension, uh, all that stuff. But, you know, to my father, it was the security, I think, that really concerned him as well as my health. But I think the security was, was a big part. Mm, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I can tell you that a lot of that mindset hasn't really left this country, really. Um like still still to this day like people from this country think like americans are like a different planet like they think that people people who have this mindset of going above and beyond and and chasing things it, it, it's 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 crazy like it's not until you go abroad and come back you really see how it is but uh yeah um but, was but just so you know it was it wasn't just in, in the irish side i had that on the mexican side too yeah. So my family, I have family, Mexican is very, very similar, where they looked at Americans, like we'd go there and they're like, she's boxing. Like you have to understand in Mexico, you know, my, my, a lot of my cousins and my family were professionals. I'm saying doctors, professors, they're like, why are you boxing? Like, what is wrong with her? But I was the American. So it was okay. <laughs> Cause I was American. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Very true. Um, so the, the abusive relationship did that end long after uh, you had started boxing. Um, it did. I, I actually uh, uh, got the strength to go and and file charges on him. I was very damaged and I was very scared and I was very confused and um, I just it was just so toxic that I didn't I still didn't want to hurt him as much as he. I mean, this man punched me in the face. I had eight stitches. The only time I've ever been stitched, even in boxing, never been stitched. I was he punched me in the face. I had eight stitches above my eyebrow. He almost killed me. Tried to strangle me to death and. I, I just felt so helpless and it took time before I could put a restraining order on him. I, I broke up with him. I tried to get away from him. He stalked me for quite a, a bit of time. And then um, I finally was able to get a restraining order on him. I had the courage to do it and the ability because of what I had. And I, and then I was able to get out. So it took me after the abusive relationship, I was probably in it 17, 18, 19, 20. I was in it for about four years. And until I had my first amateur fight, um, it was after that, that I got out, that I was able to put the restraining order on him. It was like maybe seven years, eight years later, I was able to fully get out of the relationship, mm. but boxing definitely helped me. It definitely, and the people that I met in boxing definitely helped me because mm. I felt safe enough to be able to open up and, um, and, and share what I was going through. From that, it, it, as an amateur, uh, a lot of attention came towards you, um, when you were basically helping Hilary Swank with with Million Dollar Baby, the, the the movie that she actually ultimately got an Oscar for, but um, and I've actually read some articles from this country that were interviewing you at the time, and because the interest with the Irish and that, and you had kind of said you wanted to uh, fight in Ireland eventually, but um, the Million Dollar Baby, how did that come about? Um, so when I was so I turned, it's a funny story. I turned, um, I. When I was in the other gym where I first started, I realized that they, they weren't, I wanted to fight amateur and there really wasn't, nobody really took me seriously or had the time for me. So I had a friend of mine, Louis Rosado, who was a pro at the time. And he said, listen, let's find you another gym because you know, a lot of the coaches here don't have the time and women's boxing wasn't that big. So, and they didn't think they, there was no return on investment, you know, and I really couldn't afford to pay anybody. So he helped me to find other gyms. And I went to a couple of gyms, actually one gym in particular, I had the door shut in my face where the gentleman said that there was nothing here. Like, I don't look like a fighter. You know, I wasn't welcome in the gym. 
And four years later, he was matchmaking my fights at Madison Square Garden. And he remembers shutting the door in my face. And he respected me, you know, after that. But I, you know, I, I get it, like you know. But it was my my fortitude and my resilience where I was like, I'm not done. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm gonna find a place. Somebody's gonna let me in. And I remember we went to this last gym in Yonkers on Nepperhan, and it was called New York Boxing Gym. And I was to a point where I didn't want to go inside. I was like, you know what, Lewis, I don't even want to go in because if another person tells me no or I don't look like a fighter, I'm too pretty or some nonsense, I'm gonna punch them. So he went in and he came out with a business card. And on that business card, um, the name was a Luigi Olchese. And it, he had an AOL account. So he said, listen, this guy said he knows you. And that sparked, I was like, he knows me. I'm like, nobody knows who I am. So he said, why don't you call him? And I went home and I went on AOL. If you remember dial up modem and you check the buddy list and you could find the name. So I did it and he was online and I messaged him, direct messaged him and said, hi, I got your card today from New York Boxing Gym. You know, would you be interested in training me? And he said, yes. I told him my name and everything. And he says, I remember you. And I guess I had met him at the first gym that I'd ever been at. Um, he was intrigued because I spoke Spanish and he's Peruvian and wanted to, he asked me where I spoke, where I learned Spanish because obviously I'm very Irish. So we ended up, uh, I ended up uh, walking, going and training with him. That was Luigi Olchese and that's, he's now my manager. He's been my manager. So I've been with Luigi since I was 21 years old. And he took me to a place where he realized I needed that next level training. And um, so he brought me to Gleason's gym in Brooklyn to Hector Roca. And down there is where Hillary came uh, to work with Hector Roca and he partnered me with Hillary. I think a lot of the reason behind that was because we were similar weight classes. We were similar, like similar height. And she was a little bit taller than me, but Hector also knew that I wasn't going to hurt Hillary. I knew how to work. So anytime he, I mean, he had put me in there with kids. I knew how to control my punches. So if she hit me hard, I wasn't going to retaliate and hurt her. Um, although I knew, I knew what I had, you know, I knew my abilities and he was confident in my abilities to be able to work with her. So we, we started working together three times a week sparring. And then we just became, you know, we became friends. You know, she shared a lot, a lot of the, the, the movie with me and I shared a lot of my life with her and, and what I'd been through and what I'm going through and how I feel. And she witnessed a lot of things in the gym, being around myself and other, other females and other fighters. But we, we kind of had this, you know, this real connection and, I, and we worked with each other the most than anybody else. So from that, I guess I did a couple interviews and the media kind of all of a sudden took a liking to me and my story and they just kind of came to me. And I started doing interviews, you know, like crazy. And I was invited to the premiere of the movie and invited to a lot of parties that Hillary went to. Now, mind you, I'm still trying to prove my father wrong that, you know, I can work and go to school and box. So my priority was always school and work. I was making sure because once those two, I was living under my parents' roof. You know, I, I couldn't leave. And my father, you know, he'd be like, listen, you know, you can't do all three. And he kept reminding me that. So I always felt like this, my focus was always on school and, and work. And my training was, I always found a way to make my training fit. Uh, I'm right in saying that, Hilary, she really kind of embraced it, like the training lifestyle in terms of, you would be training at like 6 a.m. and she would be with you training, if I'm right in saying that. Um, so she really kind of really delved in head first into it. She, let me tell you something. She took the train to the gym. She literally lived the life of a fighter as much as she could. She came in, she trained. She didn't have the plasticity of Hollywood where a lot of people see, you know, a lot of these, you know, and there's a, there's a lot of actors in Hollywood that don't have that you know, where they really embraced the role, you know, and, and so she really, she came in and she very much embraced the role and she very much was humble. A lot of actors come into the boxing world humble, I think, because they have a, a real respect for what we go through and they know that, you know, not everybody can take a punch. And uh, she was just very grateful, I think, and very um, wanting, very professional. I have to say that's the best word. She was very professional and just a, a very down to earth person who really wanted to embrace this role in, 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 in its whole. Yeah, and um, another thing is, because there's quite a lot of good uh, boxing films that have been out and that, but sparring wasn't necessarily one thing that, that they would do. Um, you know, they've trained very hard to look like a, fight, like a fighter and they would um, learn techniques and that, so they would look like it looked like they were throwing punches like Professor Fire, but a lot of them wouldn't spar. But I was reading that used two would spar quite a bit, and there was times Absolutely. where... I heard a story that she she punched you one time. She you got a little bit of blood, and she was stopped and said sorry to you. Um, 
and your yep. trainer told him told her to stop uh, uh, let me let me paint the picture for you so what had happened was i had actually gotten headbutted the week before in my nose i think i broke my nose then but i don't know but it was sensitive but when i got in there with hillary she hit me i mean it was a hit and it started to bleed and she didn't hurt me. It wasn't like a hard shot because my nose was already, it was already hurt. But she just, it, and she stopped. She's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And Hector jumped into the ring. What are you doing? You, and he's got a, you know, broken English because Panamanian speaks Spanish. You don't say sorry. You don't say sorry. What's wrong with you? Like screaming at her. And she just was like, and I was like, Hillary, like, don't worry about it. And I just stood there because I could see the fear on her face. And I just was like, you know, and again, you got to understand something. As a female fighter, I always felt like I had to prove myself to everybody. I felt that coming into the sport because I, I didn't look like a fighter. Back then, this was before the Ronda Rousey's and the, the femininity in boxing now. Women weren't like, I mean, Mia St. John, but I wasn't I wasn't in Playboy. You know what I mean? Like that wasn't my thing. And I didn't dress like that. You know what I mean? Not that there's anything wrong with it, but I was very conservative. And I would come into the gym and, and there were times I wasn't, and mind you, I came out of an abusive relationship. So I wasn't comfortable just flashing walking around a sports bra i would actually dress down so people would look at me more like a fighter you know i didn't wear my hair a certain way i mean i always dressed nice you know when i was outside of the gym where people didn't recognize me when i was in the gym i was trying to you know kind of fit in kind of mold in you know but um but that i just looked at her like and i felt like i had to prove myself like i had to take that shot and i had to like but i didn't have to hit her i had to just do what he told me to do so i was always looking to to please my coach so that I would still be taken seriously. Is, is it true that after that, he said to you, he said, look, make sure you hit her hard after that, just to like, let her know, like, look, you can't stop. And I don't know. Her. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, he did say that. He said, no, give her, but I, I mean, listen, I, again, I just, I didn't, it doesn't make me feel good. She's not a, she wasn't a fight. Like, this is the thing about me. And I still is true to this day. When I'm sparring, I don't go hundred percent. Some fighters do. I don't, I study in there. I work on my craft when I fight. It's another, I'm another person that switches off and it's very different. And trust me, I know myself enough with having over 30 fights to know when to put that switch on. But I also know when I'm sparring, if somebody thinks they're going to get the best of me, I'm going to spank them. In that moment with Hillary, she looked scared. So I wasn't going to take, I wasn't going to capitalize in that moment, but mm -hmm. I did pressure her more. So what the way that I pressured her was I walked her down and hit her to the body. I wasn't going to crack her in the face because what am I going to break her nose now? And what's that going to do? I remember that was my thinking because I didn't under, I wasn't, she was scared. Clearly the girl was scared, you know? So I wasn't and I'm like, she's an actress, you know, but Hector told me to pressure her more. So I pressured her, but I didn't hit her hard back. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like I'm going to show you, you know, it wasn't one of those. I wasn't, I just wasn't that person unless I was in there with another person equal or a guy that I had to kind of like defend myself with. Mm. Um, during that time, obviously, a lot of attention on yourself and uh, you interviewed a few times. And in your career, like you've been very vocal in terms of uh, Mexican and Irish in your descent. And I've seen uh, your shorts where you've had Mexican flag in the front and the Irish flag like, on the back. Um, you've actually yeah. won one world titles in Mexico and you fought in Mexico. But um, you've always expressed interest in fighting in Ireland. Is that still something that you would like to do? Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel, listen, you got to say something for me. Like I said, boxing was a gift from God. And my parents, I'll never forget, my mother and father both were like, why boxing? And I'm like, I'm Mexican and I'm Irish. It was either boxing or soccer. I mean, let's think about that. You know what I mean? Like there's, a, there's something in my, in my blood that I believe in that, that it's there. I think the personality and also just being of those two, two cultures. And I so admire, you know, both cultures for what they've been through you know, through, through time, you know, and the hardworking and the respect of the hardworking, the, you know, um, trying to find better lives fighting in uh, the Irish fighting in Ireland and, and the, and the, and the Mexican, the Mexicans in Mexico, you know, it was just, I think both those cultures for me really coming together, make me the fighter that I am. Mm. And you've been between, between a few weight classes as well, uh, like in terms of featherweight, super bantamweight, and now you're ranked obviously in bank, bantamweight as well. So you would entertain, uh, like if it was ever possible, because there's a lot of girls now, well, not a lot, but a lot more than what there was in Ireland at that weight, but still no one has ever fought, two women have never fought in this country for an Irish title, title which seems like a shame at this day and age that it still hasn't happened yet. 
Um, but is that something yeah. that you would entertain if you could get your pay, you know, if it was sanctioned? So here's my thing. What you got to understand is back then there weren't many females. So I fought at many different weight classes because I had to get the experience. Mm -hmm. And I fought a lot of tough girls. I finally, I'm finally found my weight class. My weight class is Bantam weight. Bantam, super Bantam, 122, 118. I'm very comfortable. I've been comfortable there. I walk around at 130, 128. You know, so for me, that's really like right now, I'm like 130 right now. And so I, I tend, I feel that those, that weight is, I'm comfortable with that weight. I see a lot of girls like going up and coming down and, you know, I've, I fought my way through what I fought through. And I just feel like these are my weight classes. And this is why I'm ranked in these weight classes. And I've worked very hard to get there. So I feel that that's, that's my weight class. I mean, 118, 122, those are my weight classes. If we forward a bit in time to when you turned pro, um, now I've watched some of your interviews after some fights back then. And it's crazy, like, you know, when I listened to you speaking then versus now, um, you were so much more raw then and your uh, your accent was so much more stronger back then you know and you just you were very blunt in what you said and you just you know what I mean not that you're not now obviously but like it was yeah. just you know you're ready to take on the world then at that age like you know um there was a story that where when you came up to Bob Arm and you asked to be in a show and he said no but you didn't take the usual approach didn't you not like some people would have walked away from that stage and just said okay I'm not coming in the show but you talk, took a different approach, didn't you? Yes. I prepared a, I prepared my bio, I prepared photos, and I prepared um, uh, discs, CDs of my fights. And I asked for a, a meeting with him. And I went to, and it was myself and my manager went to the meeting and we, we met him and he was there. And, and Luigi let me lead. You know, Luigi, we just introduced you, you know, said hello, Bob, whatever. And then I said to him, Bob, I, I'd really love the opportunity to fight for top rank and fight for you. And he said, well, you know, I'm really not into women's boxing. You know, um, I had a fight with Lucia Riker and Christy Martin and Lucia got hurt and it just wasn't, it just didn't work out. And it was supposed to be the million dollar lady. And I lost a lot of money. And I said, you know, Bob, with all due respect, I'm not Lucia Riker and I'm not Christy Martin. I'm, my name is Maureen Shea. And I bring a different kind of value than, than they do. And I explained to him, I said, not only will I bring the Irish fans, but I'll bring the Mexican fans, I'll bring the kids and I'll bring their mothers and their fathers. I said, if you just give me the opportunity. And he did. He looked at me and I think it was my resiliency and my, you know, that he just kind of was like, okay. He said, that's all he said. He didn't even look at my, my, this whole beautiful thing that I created for him. He didn't even look at it. He just said, okay. And that was it. And Bob, I still, I, when I see him like, you know, I know that he, he knows, he knows, you know, and, and I'm, I'm very honored and, and proud that I can say that I did that. Mm. And what's crazy is about three years later, then you were fighting for the WBA Super Featherweight title on one of his shows. Um, as far as I know, that was, that, I was, was. that was one of the first times in 10 years uh, females fought on a pay-per-view. Am I right? I think it's that show. But that one that was, no, that fight, that, so that was, Bob Aram's fight was a different time. Sorry, when sorry. I fought on pay-per-view, no, yeah, when I fought on, that was, um, it was, he had never, like, he hadn't put a female on a card in a while uh, for top rank, but it was actually Shane Mosley's card that I fought on at the Forum in California, because mind you, I lived in, so this is the thing, I lived in the Bronx, I moved to Brooklyn to be closer to Gleason's, when I parted ways with Hector Roca, I moved to Jersey, I started training in Jersey with Tommy Brooks and Terrific Gist, where I won my NABF title. Then I, I had, I discovered that I had seasonal affective disorder. I struggled with depression most of my life, never knowing what, what it was. I tried light therapy. I was medicated most of my life. Since I was 15 years old, they medicated me on antidepressants, mood stabilizers. And I had, that's why I fluctuated in weight. And this is something that a lot of people didn't know about me, uh, that that was a big reason why I never knew my true weight class because I was medicated and I, and I had a lot of issues with that. So when I moved to, I, when I left Jersey, I realized I needed to be in an area that had more consistent sunlight. And I had been to California. My mom's sister lived in California and she said, why don't you come stay with me for a little bit? And I went out to California, but I also had boxing connections out there. And I started working in, in Ventura in Oxnard, California. And I started training out there and I was out there for eight years. And I created a, an amazing community out there. I actually worked with Lomachenko's team. I worked with Victor Ortiz. I work with a lot of high-level fighters. I, I sparred it at, um, at a wild card. And 
for me, it was an amazing experience. And I, and I really, the community really embraced me and I'm very fortunate. And, and Shane Mosley gave me the opportunity to fight on. And that was in over a decade that a female was on pay-per-view and the last female was Layla Ali. And that was on uh, Shane Mosley, my orga too, at mm. the forum. And I was the co-feature for the IBF, the 122 IBF world title. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, so obviously like, as we were saying earlier on with the opportunities that women had, um, the belts weren't really a thing uh, in the 90s and whatnot for women. So the kind of the original belt was the IFBA, which you won um, in South Carolina. But then you... That was in Oxnard. Yeah, that was in Oxnard, California. I won that um, in 2015. 2014. Is that right? Yeah. 2014. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you defended it on the, the Mosley Mallorca card. Um would you say between that or the WC interim and your NABF and uh, the things that you fought for, would you say that you defending it on the Mosley car, would you say that was the pinnacle so far for you at, in your career? Um, you know, I feel like I've had quite a few. You know, for me, I never really looked at as a title I mean, I fought in the garden, fighting at Madison Square Garden for a world title was huge, you know, fighting for, for top rank, um, you know, fighting in Mexico, you know, um, even and fighting, we're fighting for the WB, the WBC. Um, so I think there's been many pinnacles, I guess, but, um, but that's definitely one of the, the big ones, you know, but I just, you know, I know I'm not done, you know, I know I'm not done. I, I it's, it's, I've, you have to say too, that a lot of people realize I'm self-promoted. I've never signed with a promoter. I've negotiated my way, me and my manager, who I've been with since I was 21, we've marketed ourselves, I've marketed myself and, and found my way through all of this without a promoter. Not saying the promoters, but I didn't have a promoter fighting for me. I fought for myself. My manager fought for me. That was it. You know, so we're still in that place where we're still fighting. You know, and it's not that I didn't have interest from promoters, but they were just, they had a different agenda for me. Some promoters didn't want me fighting in Mexico. And I'm like, why not? The fights in Mexico weren't easy. People would say, oh, you went out there to fight. I'm like, are you kidding me? Find me another female from the United States that's fought as many times as me in Mexico. And they weren't bought fights. Those girls are tough girls. Probably the, probably the toughest girls I've ever fought. Mm. Yeah. W w the most recent fight for you, obviously, for a world title was the IBF, um, Super Panama against yeah. uh, Alejandro de Luna. And like those scorecards were just all over the place because one had it for you, 98, 92. One had it for her, 97, 93. Um, and she, since then, even though she lost about, she's now WBC champion at Bantamweight. Is it frustrating for you? Like you're just, you, that's the one thing that's avoiding you so far is the real like world title, WA, WBO, IBF, WC. That's something 100%. that's eluded you at the moment. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, what bothered me after that fight, I felt I won the fight based on effective aggression. She's a very tough girl. Um, but I just I, I just felt, a lot, I know a lot of things um, that, I, that, that could have went better for me in that fight. Um, although I do feel like I, I did secure the victory. However, if you watch the interview after that fight, I specifically said I'd love the rematch. She didn't want the rematch. Okay, my manager went back to her team and requested the rematch. And they said, no, not for six months. So what happened then was, well, am I going to sit on a shelf for six months and wait to defend again or to, to fight for that title? So I went and I, I fought, I fought a, a stay busy fight or I fought a fight, you know, and, and um, I actually, I got, that's where I got injured. Mm. And, um, and then I was out for a bit. That's why there's a lapse in my boxing. And, um, you know, that was very difficult for me because I never had an injury and, um, you know, but I had to come back from that and I'm so, I'm back. And, uh, you know, I've, I've reinvented myself multiple times. In, in, in boxing and I've come back from a lot of different things that a lot of people didn't know. I think I'm more vocal about it now, but even my injury, nobody knew because I was dealing with that personally. I don't feel like I have to put everything on social media. I don't need to explain myself to everybody. You know, there's things that you need to go through. I think as a mature adult, you learn. Um, and with experience, you learn that you need to take care of you, you know, first, because if you're not good, you're not going to be good for anybody else. So I did that. I took care of myself and I, I got to spend time with my family that I had missed. You have to remember too, that I, I've been away from my family for years. I've been chasing boxing for years and I've moved away, moving from the Bronx to Brooklyn, from Brooklyn to Jersey, from Jersey to California. And some of the most important times of my father's life, my father passed away on Easter. 
and, and I moved to Florida to be closer to my father. And I'm glad that I did. And I'm very grateful that I'm here now. I have an amazing boxing coach in Derek Santos, a great strength and conditioning coach in Phil DeRue, who I actually work for as well. I'm his executive assistant. And I'm the GM of his gym that I'm in right now, you know? And so I'm still, and I'm still training. I'm still training and I'm still on my pursuit for a world title that I know is, 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 is right. Um, including, you know, I was supposed to fight for a world title in May mm. and then COVID hit. So I lost that opportunity, you know, but I still am up there in the rankings and the opportunities are there. And I'm, and you know, my managers, you know, got to make it happen. You know, I, I, you know, that felt that, that, that was fought for that was bought by the promoter, you know, that, that was my, my ranking. And I, I felt that I should have been the one fighting for that belt. So it, just to, to, to basically uh, clear up what you were just saying there. So um, originally when I was actually f- f- finding your name, now I don't know how I didn't remember, but anyway, when the rankings came up, so Shannon O'Connell posted the rankings after uh, Shannon Courtney and Ebony Bridges fought for WA Bantamweight World title that was vacant. And originally it's been going around in circles for quite a while because first Rachel was going to play Ebony for it and then it was... Uh, Rachel and Shannon and then it became um, Ebony and Shannon but when Shannon O'Connell posted those rankings it was her as number one and you as number two which drew my attention because Maureen Shea I was like um, obviously very Irish and I was like right I actually didn't know this and Shannon was number eight and Ebony was number nine so then I was like, this is strange. So that's how I kind of contacted your manager. And he told me the whole situation where you were supposed to fight for the belt um, in May. And then when he went back to them, not so long afterwards, they said, oh, the, the belt is about matrim now for a fight. How would it, like, in men's, as far as I understand, usually even if, if there's a vacant title and two people fight for it that aren't one and two ranked, usually a mandatory is called immediately afterwards. How did this happen? What is the situation at the moment? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. I know that I'm, I'm, I'm letting, I mean, as of February, I was ranked number one and, you know, I'm, I leave that up to my manager. You know, that's, that's his part in it and fighting for me. And I, I'm, my job is to stay ready. You know, I would welcome to fight any of those girls, you know, um, you know, I've got the experience. They're, they're young, they're young girls, whether I don't care what their ages are, mm. you know, I've got over 30 fights. You know, I'm 29 and two with 13 knockouts. I've got, I've been boxing since I was 17 years old. I'm 40 years old and I'm in the best shape of my life. I understand my body. I understand my mind. And I'm very much still in this game, you know, whether people want to admit it or not, I'm here and I've been here and I've been, you know, I've been, I've been working and I'm still working. And so, you know, I, I, that's my job and I do my job and I let Luigi handle the rest, you know, mm-hmm. so he's got it. They got to figure out what's going on with that, what, what, what the, the plans are, but you know, in my mind, I'm starting camp on Monday. Mm. Whether I fight or not, I'm starting camp on Monday. But I've been training. I don't get me wrong. I've been training. But I just go to a different place. Mm-hmm. Um, originally in May when you were supposed to fight for it, w- do you know, was it supposed to be against Shannon O'Connell? Um, no, I don't I don't think so. I, I'm not sure who the girl was. I don't even remember, to be honest with you, because that was all going on. And then um, Luigi would have more of that information. And this is where people are like, how do you not know? I'm like, because... <laughs> my job I've always looked at it was in the past we was like you need to know like I didn't need to know like he's like listen you just need to train and fight that's your because now even now that I understand the business and I understand how everything works I can't get emotional anymore you know so I just ask him get me whatever the fight is tell my tell tell Derek you know my boxing coach who we're fighting they start to get me ready then when the time comes because listen opponents switch out like this sometimes especially in women's boxing so what am I going to go and focus on one person? I'm like, you know what? I'd rather not even know. Let me just get myself where I need to be. And then when we get closer and it's time to sit down and look at the fights and, and get ourselves prepared, that's what we do. Mm. Um, the fight itself afterwards, um, were you surprised that then they basically said, uh, oh, well, the next fight is going to be Rachel Ball now for this belt? Um, was that a shock to you? Because Luigi said you were you were told by the WBA that you were going to be next. Nothing's a shock to me. Okay, I was called by Matchroom a couple months ago to fight for the 130 pound champion in 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 Florida. I said I haven't fought at 130 pounds in I don't know how many years. And I said to their matchmaker, I said, Hey, I said, how about how about I fight Rachel Ball? How about I fight somebody in my weight class? I said, How about that? 
I said, why are you going to make, why do you want me to go and fight a girl that's not my weight class in a where I'm not even ranked in my hometown? I'm like, how about you put me to fight Rachel Ball in my hometown for a, 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 for a, for a ranking in a belt that's rightfully mine, you know? And he was like, oh, oh, well, you know, you should have Luigi call Eddie Hearn. I'm like, okay, listen, this is the thing. I got too much, like... It's just, it's so, it's so, I don't get, I don't even, I can't anymore. It's ridiculous. It gets to a point where it gets ridiculous. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, it, it just is. I mean, am I, am I a little frustrated? Yeah. But I'm also like, you know what? I have a lot of faith. God is my higher power. And Jeremiah 29, 11 is my life verse. And God has a plan for my life. He would have gotten me out of boxing a long time ago. I'm still here. I still train with the same vigor, the same as when I was 17 years old, the same excitement when I'm in the gym. You can ask any of my teammates. They, they're like, man, you, even my sparring. You know, I'm right there. I'm on point. And I'm, I love what I do and I'm good at it. I'm very good at it. So I just got to keep doing it, keep loving it. And I believe my time's going to come, but yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. It's very annoying. And I appreciate, you know, people like yourself who, who, who give me the opportunity to speak about my position and where I'm at. But trust me, if I started getting real up and down and screaming and yelling, like it's not, it's just, I just can't, you know what I mean? It just, it's, it's, you understand being in this sport for so long, it's just like, oh, here we go again. Like, what, what else is going to happen, you know? But you better believe that when that time comes, because it will, I'll be more than ready. And I'll be there to claim what's mine, rightfully mine. Mm. You look at that fight, the two of them fighting, um, the two of them now haven't been pro very long. Uh, what, Shannon turned over in 2019, and I think Ebony uh, was very much the same at the end of 2019. What did you think looking at the fight um, in terms of, for you being matched up with either of them, um, were you impressed? Were you, what was your thoughts on the, on the fight? Tough girls. Very, very tough. I see, I see the efforts. I see the resilience. I see, I would have fought the fight differently. You know, um, I know exactly how to fight them because I'm a boxer puncher. So I am very comfortable on the inside and I'm very comfortable on the outside. Um, I have a lot of experience and that's the thing that people underestimate. I got a lot of experience. I fought every style. I fought southpaws. I fought punchers. I fought boxers. I fought MMA fighters that were boxers that were super awkward. You know, I fought at the highest levels. Madison Square Garden. I fought the experience where I had, even as an amateur, I had access Hollywood in my locker room fighting in the Golden Gloves. Nothing phases me. I'm prepared for anybody. I don't underestimate anybody. When I get that, understand that. Those girls were very tough, but the experience lacked on both sides. So that fight was exactly how it was supposed to go with two inexperienced girls fighting each other. You know, they fight me, completely different animal. Very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny, your story isn't too um, unusual. For, for, like, it's very common in this country for, for us because um, the domestic scene in Ireland isn't ama amazing in terms of obviously money. And a lot of guys, they get up to 10 and 0, whatever it is, and they win an Irish title. And then it's like they're European rank, but they don't have any TV behind them. And it's like, what do I do? So Eddie Hearn usually comes in and says, oh, you can fight on my show for a belt against this guy, but it's the next weight class up. And I'll give you three weeks notice. And it's kind of like, no, I'm ranked higher than him in the Europeans. And it's kind of like being pigeonholed in. It's, it's a very difficult situation. Very like yours. Yeah. yeah. Um, Listen, so I, I see that Eddie Hearn to do with females i see that he's giving females the platform mm. but put on the fair fights put on the right fights if you're gonna put these girls to have for fight for belts have them defend i mean you know like have them fight like real champions <laughs> you know what i mean women that are that are that they're gonna be tested against mm -hmm. i've been tested i fought some tough girls i've been tested i've been down i got back up never got stopped you know so have these girls get tested they're not doing them a favor I don't feel that Ebony Bridges and they got tested against this level. You know, if you want to be up here, then you got to fight who's up here and you're not, you're fighting here. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm quite surprised as well that um, I think someone like you going over to fight on, let's just say one of their shows for, for that belt. I think it would make a lot of sense. If, if, if you were Eddie Hearn thinking in your head, you're like, right. Okay. Um, she's fought on Mosley Mayoga card. She has uh, all these belts that she's won. Um, she's fought on uh, Kelly Pavlik um, as well, fighting. And right, she's forty now. In his mind, obviously, he would think you're forty, thinking right. Well, she's at the end, but she's a very credible record, so I can take her in. And uh, do you know what I mean? Um, 
and it, 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 would, it would build my own fire. But uh, so from that aspect, it, I'd be surprised if he wouldn't be interested in bringing you over. But obviously, you would have you would have different plans in your mind, obviously. Yeah. No, he tried to do that, but had me fight yeah. at 100, like you said, had me fight 130 pounds. Yeah. Like, why? And then I said, why not put me against Rachel Ball? I'd be more than happy to fight her. Or mm. before this whole this whole thing happened, like, why are you going to have me fight? Why, why am I going to sell myself out? I've worked so hard to get to where I am. Why? I'm not going to sell myself out for that. I'm not. You know, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not necessary. You know what I mean? And I know my worth and I know my value inside the ring and outside the ring. I know how marketable I am and I know what I can do because I know who I am and I know how I fight. And I'll tell you right now, every time I fought, people leave there like, wow, you, you, you're the best fight of the night. And that's credit to my opponents as well, because they're very tough girls and they came in there to fight. Same thing with Yuleha Luna. I mean, we put on a heck of a fight together, you know, and it was a very, it was a, it was a very hard fought fight by, on both parts, you know? I mean, the same thing with Kina, Marpartida, that I fought in the garden. Um, you know, I dropped her in the first round. I unfortunately blew my eardrum in the fifth round. And unfortunately, my coach wasn't in my corner either. People didn't know that. Hector Roca went to Belgium to train to fight with a male fighter. And I fought for my first world title by myself without my coach in my corner. That, that wasn't fun. But it didn't matter because I knew in that moment, that was my first loss. I was 13 and 0. I remember looking at her and looking at that belt and saying, like, that's my belt. I'm not done. And I kept going from then on. And then I made changes I needed to make. And I learned a lot of lessons. I got a lot of experience. Mm. And some people, they're dangerous. Can you tell, or, or do you know who you were going to, who they offered to fight in, in Florida? And when, when about was that show? Um, the one in May. I think it was in May. Um, there was a girl from Spain. I don't remember her name. And um, I think there was another girl. Luigi had two girls. So again, I don't know. Like I didn't, I didn't know exactly who it was. That's his, his part. I'm like, okay. And then we were, it was set, but then, you know, I started camp and then COVID hit and that was in May, but COVID hit, I think it was like February or March when they told me like, they're moving things around. And I was like, okay. You know, I thought, and then I didn't know it was going to be as bad as it was. And then, um, you know, then after that, it was just, you know, I just, I stayed training. I tried to stay ready. And then I got the call to fight the 130 pound champion. And I'm like, like, again, like, you know, I'm not going to sell myself out. You know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't make sense for me. And that's the raw. That's the truth. I work too damn hard to just be like, oh, let me just go fight at 130 pounds. I walk around 130 pounds. Why am I going to do that? That's to me, that's not smart. It's, it's, you know, and, and for the opportunity, I've had the opportunities. I've won the belts. But not, I'm still stuck on, I'm going to get what I deserve and what I've worked for, some, one way or the other. Mm. And also, financially speaking, I need to fight and get paid. I'm not going to get paid garbage money. You know, that's not right. I've, I've been one of the women that stayed in it. You know, a lot of the girls that started when I was around, you know, when I, when I was coming up, they, they fell off. And I don't blame them. It was not easy staying the course like I have and moving my life multiple times. To, 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 to better myself and to get the experience that I've gotten. You know, I've done a lot of things that a lot of women can't say they've done. There's no female that's ever ran with Lomachenko or trained in a camp with all those Olympians from other countries. And they respect me. They, those guys respect me because of my work ethic and my focus, you know? And I knew, and, and even when, when I trained at Knuckleheads with Joseph Janik, who I won the world titles with, training around uh, Victor Ortiz, David Rodella, Francisco Santana, I mean, those guys respect me to this day. I have no bad, bad blood with anybody, you know, because I'm still here and I'm still grinding. You know, now I train around Sullivan Barrera. You know, I mean, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I, I train with Dustin Poirier, strength and conditioning coach, who just beat Conor McGregor. Who's fighting with Conor McGregor again. I'm one. I'm the best. I'm one of the best in the world, and I put myself around the best always to get better, mm. whether they're men or women. You know. Mm -hmm. I was just, I, just listening there. I can I can sense the. Um, passion from you and I was just looking at a few different things in your career and um, I was going to kind of finish up on this but yeah. you, when you fought for the WA Super Featherweight uh, World Title you got stopped and then you fought you fought three times in MSG two twice on Paddy's Day but um, but immediately after you fought Lindsay Garbath who was only two and two at the time and then you got stopped by her immediately afterwards like a lot of people after that would have been thinking where do I go now I'm, I'm done and then 
you had a really long layoff with an injury. That's another thing that would happen to fires and thinking, I'm ready to pack it in. Now, where you are now, you're ranked number one for well over a year and a half. And you're thinking, Matrim are basically, I've basically bought the belt. How do you, how do you keep yourself motivated and stop yourself, not motivated, but driven in terms of going right? Well, I'm not going to give up. And how have you not said to yourself, what's the point? I'm just going to, I'm just going to pack it in. A lot of prayer. I, I'm, I very, I'm very, I believe in prayer and I, and I, and I feel I've, I've talked to God and I say, if it's not meant for me, I know you'll show me he's moved me in my life. Um, you know, moving everywhere I have in my life, I've always prayed. And I know that I have a lot of people that pray for me. And there's this feeling that I know in my heart that I just know, and I'm, I'm still capable. I'm still able, and I'm still good at it and I'm getting better. So I'm like, and boxing, listen, I live the lifestyle. I always have anybody who knows me from my Gleason's days. I've always lived the lifestyle. Like you're always in shape. A lot of people have said, I'm kind of like a Chris Algieri, you know, Chris Algieri is a friend of mine and he's trains, you know, he trains here in Florida with us and we're always in shape. Like we never get out of shape, you know? And, and so I live the lifestyle, but I still have that fight in me. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I, like I said, it's, it's a lot of prayer and a lot of like, you know, I really believe God has a plan for my life and I don't believe I'm done. And it's, you know, and, and I know when it'll be time because people say, oh, you're going to retire in this. I know when it's time and it's just not time yet, you know? So I'm, I'm still, you know, it's, 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 it's frustrating. Don't get me wrong. And there's days that I'm, I struggle, but I know enough with my experience and my maturity to take a step back, reassess, realign, and then come back. I'm not, I don't force myself to be in the gym with my experience and, and, and my background. I really, I, I don't need, I don't spar if I'm not fighting because I do want to make sure that I protect my brain. Um, it's unnecessary, but I do other things to stay in shape, especially my strength and conditioning. I'll be honest. The best thing I ever did was work with Phil Daru. And it's because he knows, he knows my personality and he knows how I am. And he knows how to maintain me without having to keep me in, in boxing. You know, I'm not, if I'm not just boxing, I'm, I'm here. And I'm doing things that emulate my boxing, but in my strength and conditioning to maintain my body, especially at 40 years old. You know, I mean, I've got my muscle is mature muscle. I've had this for so long, but now I'm learning how to use it functionally and I'm learning how to maintain it functionally and also just get excited. I get excited when it's time to box. You know, I was in the gym the other day and, and I'm, I'm excited to, to work the mitts and work on new combinations. I have fun in there. I put on music. I put on salsa music. I dance salsa. I, you know, we play around. I have a great team around me and. We have fun. If, it, if it's not fun, then why do you do it? You know, and listen, even when I retire, you don't think that I'm going to be like, all right, let's spar. I love helping the younger girls. I have a young sparring partner now that I work with, you know, and, and the other girls coming up. Avril Matthews is a sparring partner of mine, you know, and, and, and I've worked with her down in with Javier Centeno in the Fifth Street down in Miami. And it's exciting to see these girls coming up and, and the, the respect that they I know they have for me. Carolina Duar from Argentina. I've sparred with her as well. You know, she's one of the girls that came up during the time that I was coming up as well. And it, it's nice when we reconnect and, and we can help each other, you know, and the respect is there and she's older as well. Well, uh, so I guess, I guess that's your question. it's just, I love what I do. I love boxing and I love getting better. And I love now that I can sit back and study and analyze and, and pick out and then, you know, try to, try to do it. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you think you'd be one of those people that it, it would be really difficult for you to retire? Like like Chris Algieri's, one of Chris Algieri's last opponents, Tommy Coyle. Like he's been mm -hmm. really difficult retiring because um, he loved it so much. But he's so many other businesses and things that he does. He's such a great entrepreneur. He doesn't need it, but he just misses it so much. Um, what about you? Do you think yeah, you'd be yeah. Who's that that misses it that has other things? Tommy Coyle, uh, he fought uh, Chris Algieri on the yeah. AJ Ruiz card in. That's right. Yeah, yeah. But he's found it, he, he's a great entrepreneur, lots of businesses, doesn't need boxing, but he just loves it. He misses it so much that he's found find it very hard. Would you be like that? I, no. think, I don't think so. Um, I look at even Chris. Chris has other businesses. I have other businesses. You know, I have other things going on. I'm prepared for when I retire um, financially and I'm secure. And, and actually, you know, it's made it even better for me to be able to focus on boxing because I'm, I'm okay. I don't, you know, I'm not out there. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm okay. You know what I mean? I know where I'm going afterwards. That's already set up, but I know that I can still do it, you know? And I'm like, wh why not? But 
for me, I have a goal. And like you talked about, you know, getting what's rightfully mine is part of my goal. I didn't go through all this, go through the fire to not get my opportunity that's rightfully deserved and rightfully earned. And so that's why I'm still here. And I'm still going to fight for that, for that until, you know, until I'll know, I'll know when it's, when it's done. But as long as I have Luigi in my corner, I've got my, my boxing and my strength and conditioning coach that are 100% on my team. Um, you know, they're completely in my corner and they don't want me to stop. They know, they know they're right on the same page with me. So we just got to keep going and keep pushing. Right. Well, Maureen, um, I think we've got as much as we can in there and I really appreciate your time. Um, Thanks, I really yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great to get that, um, that insight from yourself. And uh, yeah, I really hope that you do get what you want over the next year hopefully the next six months um and uh, yeah, yeah hopefully i would see you very very soon <laughs> okay sounds good thank you so much thank you maureen thanks